My play of the day from round three of the Tal Memorial is Nakamura against Karyakin. Let's get straight into the game. Nakamura with the white pieces and Karyakin played the Grunfeld. And Nakamura played quite a quiet system. This bishop d2, quite a modest opening. He's not trying to refute the Grunfeld. And here you might recall that the game Anand against Hammer from the Norway chess tournament continued with castles and there was a very, very sharp game on the board where Anand attempted to checkmate Hammer um, and actually succeeded. <laughs> but instead, Karyark, instead of castling here, Karyakin played c5 immediately. Of course, not a bad move and a typical move to attack the centre. So if white wants anything here, you have to push on. So Karyakin exchanged, uh, castles, and well, instead of all this h4 stuff, Nakamura played quite solidly, just bringing out his pieces. And we have an absolutely typical Grunfeld position on the board where white has this past d pawn and well, it's well, it's yet to be seen whether this is a strength or a weakness. Can black blockade this and play round the pawn, or can white later use this passed pawn? Let's see. Karyakin brought out this queen's bishop. This queen's bishop often ha has difficulty finding a decent diagonal, so it doesn't look like a bad idea to exchange off this bishop. Now, if this knight could get to d6 to blockade that pawn and then the knights would look at these squares all around sort of looming over the ramparts of that d pawn then i think black would have a very pleasant position indeed <clears throat> but with the knight on d7 it's less easy to blockade that pawn and in fact well, it's easy to blockade it, but it's the wrong blockading piece. If you blockade with the queen, then somehow it, it's not such a pleasant position for black. The queen should be um, yeah, on more active duty somehow. But still, it looks like a very comfortable position for black. Let's, let's see what happened. It's, it's actually a, quite remarkable how uh, Nakamura managed to get the advantage here so easily, actually. So the blockade looks strong, but now this is the start of, well, how, how Nakamura got the advantage. I really like this move. Bishop a6, great move. First thing to notice is that if the d-pawn is taken, then this loses material to bishop b7 so pawn can't be taken rook b8 played so well there's possibly a threat here now but nakamura stops that with c4 now it's he's played this pawn c4 but he's done so with the bishop outside the pawn chain very important indeed so the bishop can reach this crucial diagonal very very easily and it's this knight which is still a huge problem for black. It lacks a really good square. Now the bishop comes to b5 and we can see that the contours of the game are sort of taking shape now. This bishop prevents black from challenging white's rook on the e-file. So Nakamura has control of the e-file now. And so he has a really simple plan just to bring up all his heavy pieces here and this knight is still struggling to find a really good square now of course the knight would love to come into f5 and then perhaps after the queen moves to find its way to d6 but here's a really important move from black from white g4 a positional move just taking away the squares from that knight and you can see the knight is basically stuck all those squares are taken and well this knight never really reaches a good square for the entire game 
So Karyakin very passively placed with black here. And although you know there's no direct invasion for white, basically white can build up um, very slowly here. A4, an interesting move. Nakamura keeps this one in reserve. It's possible a5 will come, which will either split the pawns or maybe he put the pawn on a6 and then the a7 pawn becomes a target for later on. So Karyakin is desperate to find counterplay here and lashes out with f5. But of course, that's a very double-edged move because you weaken your own king also weaken the e6 square but I can understand why he desperately wanted some counterplay and basically Nakamura just sits there and just holds his position and just builds up slowly so the Queen now has the possibility to come into h6 so but it's it's slow and steady progress for white he's basically just holding the position and Karyakin makes the decision to go into an end game understandable given the pressure on his position and nakamura just just holds things he doesn't need to to prove himself here you know he maintains his positional advantage of course the problem for black is that after these exchanges of course the d pawn becomes stronger it's it's not so simple to blockade that pawn now. Okay, black's still trying to find a square for that knight. So if the pawn is exchanged, then the knight will be able to find its way to d6. Well, this is an important moment, actually. Black could take here and then play the knight to e8, coming around to d6. Now, there are a couple of options for white. White would consider the king and pawn ending, although I think that's probably a draw. It's, it's rather, that's rather complicated. But White can simply play rook e6 here and snap off the g pawn, and that should be winning. So even though the knight finally gets there, not good enough. So Karyakin waits, and now Nakamura just slowly builds. Now he's just waiting. And it's, it's very hard for black to play this position. You're not quite sure where white is going to attack. Is white going to press on the king side? Is he going to push on the queen side with a5 and open a file there? That's entirely possible. But I think Nakamura plays this very cleverly indeed. He doesn't actually commit himself. And he just lets black stew in his own juice. And in fact, without doing too much... Karyakin makes a blunder. So here, for example, I think Karyakin should just keep you know, a solid control over the d-pawn, just prevent the d-pawn advancing. And you know, White still has to prove himself here. He might go for a5, he might go for something else, might try something on the king side, but Nakamura still has to make the break. But instead, king f7 was played, I think, this is a clear mistake because now the d pawn advances and black is in huge trouble. Now it looks as though black is sort of blocking out white's king, but in fact, there's going to be a way through. I mean, it's hardly surprising when black is tied to defending against the advance of the d pawn. So finally, the knight comes over, it finds a square, but well, it's basically tied to defending. So the knight had to come there to prevent bishop uh, rook to e8. Okay, they repeat a couple of times. And now here's the, the crucial breakthrough. This is, this is a beautiful breakthrough, but I mean, it's kind of unsurprising that there's something there, but still, it's, it's very nice indeed. And now if uh, knight takes bishop, then rook e8 wins. So black is, is really tied down here. Karyakin took this. And now here's the point, g5 check. And there's a really nice tactic behind this move. If king takes pawn, then the winning move is bishop g8, shutting out the rook. So 
no defense to d8 because if rook takes bishop rook check and rook takes rook very nice tactic so the king had to step aside the rook comes up to support the pawn if well black is in a kind of sugzwang here basically whatever black plays he's compromising his position so for example if the king comes back then check and now check again and the pawn queens so rook d8 was played and now the bishop transfers so still holding on to the d pawn but it just means the king is very poorly placed now you know this bishop controls the g6 square so black really can't do much at all the knight can't move either because here again a nice tactic if, then rook e8 and if rook takes then bishop g6 check wins so basically black is just waiting now and i, I mean i think there are several ways to win this position for white but uh, nakamura selects a really elegant way basically he's just waiting in this position if he moves the king up, then h3, well, that can't be taken because it's check. Um, but Nakamura waits, and h3 here would be met by bishop takes pawn, and that can't be taken. It's no longer check, and the pawn queens. This position is Tuxfang. Black has no decent move. Um, let's go through some options. If... Well, king g7, rook e7 check wins if the king goes to the back rank, then that's a queen. Or, let me see, well, if rook d8, then, well, we can just advance the king and we'll just mop up the pawns. That's actually very easy, and then the king goes in. Um, well, Karyakin played f3, and rook e1 was played... And here, Karyakin resigned. Again, the position is Tsugtsang. Let's look at this again. If uh, knight here, then, uh, well, I think rook e8 wins here. Um, g6 is also winning and, and rook e8. Or king g7, rook e7 check wins again. And rook d8 again, just king f3. And if h3, well, we'll take that. And let's just see what happens um, if black just waits. So he's running out of moves now. So white will take the pawn. Let's just see what happens. Basically, white slowly but surely advances up the board. Now the threat is just to play bishop f5 check to drive the king back. And if check... Rook has to go back, and there we go. The white king comes in. Lovely uh, positional performance from Nakamura. So, after three rounds, the players are bunching. Mamadyarov, Gelfan, Nakamura, and Caruana all have two points. The other decisive results today, Anand beat Morozevich, and Caruana defeated Carlsen in uh, a rook and pawn ending that really Carlsen should have drawn. There you go. I've, I've been saying for, for a long time, Carlsen really should improve his endgames. Thanks for watching.